to produce fuel. Now, with, that's particularly an issue with first generation biofuels. Nowadays, some biofuels are made out of algae, which swim in the water and it's just waste anyway. Um, so there are some developments there. The big problem is, if you think of all the aircraft flying around in the world at any time, we need quite a lot of biofuel. And the scale at the moment is not there. So we don't have enough, not even near enough biofuel to um, uh, run the aircraft. But airlines like to focus on that because passengers think it's in, uh, effective. They promote it a lot. And here you've got Richard Branson drinking a coconut. And basically, um, Virgin uh, tries to produce um, biofuel from coconuts, and that's why they advertise it a lot. And about six years ago, they had the first flight using biofuel from London to Amsterdam with no passengers, with, I know, 20% biofuel and the rest normal fuel. So it's quite in the beginning, really, it's in infancy, but uh, it might become more important in future. And then some developments take it just a bit too far. Now, generally, I'm quite positive about the EasyJet, and I think they've really generally tried to make a difference when it comes to the environment. But six years ago, they come up with that idea, the EasyJet EcoJet. They developed an aircraft. Now, it's the first time, to my knowledge, that an airline has tried to develop an aircraft. It looks pretty. The, 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 ro the roads at the end are a bit unusual. But um, they say, oh, it will use uh, less fuel, produce fewer CO2 emissions, fewer nitrogen oxide emissions. It will be quieter. It's the perfect aircraft. And as I said in the beginning, I'm usually quite positive about EasyJet and what they try to do for the environment, but I think this quote from the Friend of the Earth really summarizes it. It seems more like a speculative airline wish list than a firm proposal, because basically no aircraft manufacturers at the moment planning to produce this aircraft, nor do we probably have the technology to achieve these uh, emissions uh, reductions and the noise reduction. So it's very nice to quote that, but we're getting very close to greenwash here, I think. Right, at the end, um, what can we say about green airline marketing? Air transport in its current form, and also probably in future for a long time, is not sustainable, which makes it very difficult to do proper green airline marketing. We know that some passengers, some passengers though, differentiate between airlines based on their green image. So probably it makes business sense for some airlines really to focus on the green agenda because people recognize that. Also, some measures are perceived as more environmentally friendly than others. So propeller aircraft, good for the environment, very good for fuel burn, but passengers don't like it. Having a positive attitude, new aircraft might make some differences, but people like that. So if you tell people you do something for the environment, that might help you in achieving a positive environmental image. <coughs> so some airlines have produced elements of green marketing, but that's the last slide. I'm not sure if it's green marketing. I think it's more likely green oil marketing. And some people even might say it is greenwash. Well, thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to some questions. agreement between the European Union and the United States affected the market in Europe? Okay. Um, with regards to the Open Skies, so does everyone know what the Open Skies Agreement is? No. Yes. no. So something, who knows and who doesn't know? Who doesn't know? Hands up. Okay, I'll start with that. Um, going back a long way to 1944 or so, um, so the Second World War was still going on, um, there was a big discussion, how, once the war is over, how do we deal with air transport? Should we allow every airline to fly where they want, or should we have quite a strict regulation where airlines can fly to? And in the end, they decided we have a strict regulation. So basically, if you own an airline before, particularly the 1980s or so, you couldn't just fly where you wanted. You had to get, wait for a so-called bilateral agreement, an agreement between two countries that would allow you to fly between two countries. So for example, if I only go back eight years ago, when you flew from London Heathrow to New York, you could only fly on four airlines. American Airlines, United, British Airways, and Virgin. No other airline was allowed, based on the agreement between the United States and the United Kingdom, to operate on that route. 
So it was very strict. And since then, we've seen this open skies agreement, which allows any airline to operate on any route. And we even saw that as soon as the open skies agreement came in, Air France decided to fly from London Heathrow to LA. British Airways set up a French um, company flying from Paris to New York. So it allows kind of more freedom in air transport. And coming back to your question, how is it affected demand? Obviously, because this, if you think before, you had only four airlines, for example, on the Heathrow uh, US routes, suddenly you've got continent, well, Continental moved in, but now they merged with another airline, but you've got Delta. You've got more airlines operating on that route. You've got more airlines operating, that creates more competition, that reduces fares, and usually that means more people are traveling. So in that respect, I think we can see that if you just purely look at the market, that will obviously enhance the travel opportunities and more people will travel. I don't think it's the major issue with regards to environmental aspects, but it certainly contributes to the growth in air travel. What do you think are the main small things airlines can change in order to just be a little more sustainable without changing parts of the plan or without changing its concept? I think it, it, small things won't make a difference. So that, that's the first, the first message. You can't just because of um, the CO2 emissions that are produced, particularly during the flight. So if you look at the kind of whole aircraft operations, 95% of the emissions happen in the air. And there's very little you can do. You can fly a bit slower, but at one point, it will drop out of the sky. And that's, for example, if we look at uh, shipping, a lot of large shipping companies, you know, think of container ships, they can really go much slower and they save a lot of fuel. We can't do that in air transport. Yes, you can invest in new aircraft, but as we said, it takes time to get them. It's also very expensive. So, I just, my message is you can't do little things. I mean, you can recycle. And it's all, I'm not saying it's bad for the environment, and it's probably, and even if you recycle on board, if you offer no free food, I don't think it's greenwashed. If you offer carbon offsetting, it's not greenwashing. I think it has a positive impact on the environment, but it doesn't solve the big issues. It's greener, but not green. So I'm, I'm afraid I can't really give you an answer about little things. All these kind of things I've mentioned are good, but they don't solve the big problem. Yeah? Can I say, like, this greener market is just like something like greenwashing or and yeah, okay, you can change something, but... Absolutely, I mean, that's, that's why in the end, I'm not saying green airline marketing exists if you take it in its, the definition that I gave you before to have sustainable, uh, sustainability in there. If we see green marketing as a way to improve the environmental output, even if it's small, then probably yes. But if you see green marketing in a sense that it needs to be sustainable, I agree with you, we don't have it in air transport and probably will not have it for a very, very long time. So I'm not, I'm not sure it's purely greenwash, because as I said, for example, some airlines, I think they really try to work hard to reduce their emissions, but they still produce emissions. So the only way to reduce emissions is to not fly. And I don't think we as passengers would like that and the airlines wouldn't like that either. But it is, it's very difficult, as I said before, so there's a very fine line between green wash and green marketing. So my favorite is usually green own marketing, although as I said with the EcoJet, I think we're getting very close to green wash. Uh, why do they make it a mandatory, why they should, I think, to carbon offset, for example? Why do they give like an option to, to pay more? Okay, um, well, in some countries, we do have uh, some kind of air passenger duty. They introduced it in the UK a few years ago, it increased. The airlines hate it because obviously it increased their prices, it's difficult to sell. In the Netherlands, they introduced this uh, air passenger duty. There was so, much so, much, so many complaints that people would fly from Belgium, from Germany, that they had to abolish it again. So the problem is if you've got one country introducing it, particularly if you've got neighboring airports that don't offer that, that can cause big issues. Same, for example, in Northern Ireland. Uh, the UK has this air passenger duty, and usually, which is dependent on how far you fly. If you fly from Belfast to New York, you pay this duty. If you fly from Dublin, you don't pay it. So therefore, if one country does it but the other ones don't, I think it, that, that's the biggest issue because airlines from that country will complain. Now, there have been some um, 
market measures, particularly in the European Union, but introduce the EU emissions trading scheme, which I think from an economist perspective is fantastic because you have basically a market creating supply and demand for CO2, and then the price is somewhere depending on how much supply and demand there is. But then there was a complaint from airlines outside the EU that they didn't want to pay for that. There are international treaties that actually don't allow that. So for example, if we take fuel, aircraft, when you go to the petrol station, you pay some fuel tax. Airlines don't pay that. Now, a lot of people say, why don't we just introduce a fuel tax? Simple answer, you're not allowed to. There's this international treaty, the Chicago Convention, which most countries signed, and in the Chicago Convention it stated that you're not allowed to put fuel duty on fuel for airlines. So if you are Austria or Germany or the EU as a whole, you cannot introduce that without all the other signatory countries, and we're talking about I don't know, 190 countries, agreeing to that. And there will, there will be some countries that will oppose that. So I agree with you, probably the best solution is some kind of regulatory framework where we are forced to pay for that, but it's very difficult to implement. Um, do you think that it would be helpful to introduce some um, stricter laws to prohibit, for example, short flights and things like this? Okay, well, my personal, I'm not sure how it works, but my personal opinion is, why should we, I mean, short flights, obviously, you've got high-speed trains in many countries, so you can substitute them. Um, with regards to kind of putting a penalty or kind of how often you fly or whether you can fly or not, I think it goes for a bit too far. But I would like to see, and I'm not sure how it would work, but to have personal carbon allowances for all of us. And if you want to sit in winter in your house with 25 degrees, that's fine, but probably therefore you can't fly that often. If you do decide to have a 3.3 litre Mercedes car, that's fine, but probably that will use some of your other carbon credits. So I think some carbon credit system would be really good, but I don't think we could monitor at the moment yet how we individually use carbon. Uh, I think, for example, that you are able to fly from Vienna to Tyrol, for example, yeah. and then that you are able to fly from Vienna to well, first of all, you're talking to someone I've once flown, twice flown to Innsbruck, and actually the, the route that I've most travelled by air is from Manchester to London, which is about 250 kilometres, and um, yeah, so uh, personally I, I've, I've used these short trips usually to connect to another flight. Yeah. And, and for example, if we take, um, even if it's fly to Innsbruck, I think by train it's about five hours or so, mm -hmm. and fly. Four, four hours, 20 minutes. Four hours, 20. Flying even, is about... It's even faster if you take... Like, it's even faster. The train is faster than the car. Yeah, oh, yeah, so the car takes even longer. But if you fly, it's about half an hour, 45 minutes. Yeah, but then there's, like, all this time you need to get to the airport, and then, like, you have to get to the airport, you have to be there earlier, and then from the airport you still have to get to get where you have to be, and if you just take the train, you're always in the centre of the city. That, that's true. But why do some people fly trains from then? Is it cheaper? Okay. No. I mean, we can see there's a very final of discussion. There's a, some people say the air transport is just too cheap. And I must admit, when I uh, started working in Huddersfield, I could fly for 60 euros return from Manchester to London. That was cheaper than the train, that was cheaper than driving. Now it's a bit more expensive. So obviously, you could prohibit it in some respect, but a lot of these short flights are mainly there to connect to long haul connections. So a lot of times when I fly from Manchester to London, it is to, um, to catch a, a long haul flight or fly to somewhere else. Now, in the case of Heathrow, for example, that wouldn't work. You can't reuse another train because if I take the train from Manchester to London, I arrive in the centre of London, and that's one of the advantages of rail journeys, but then I have to take an hour on the Piccadilly line to Heathrow. So I think one solution would be to substitute some of the shorter flights with high-speed trains. And that's, a, I think, a good solution. And we see that in some countries. So, for example, in Germany, Lufthansa works with uh, the national railway provider. And you can actually check in at the railway station, put your bag at the railway station, connect through Frankfurt, for example, and go on a long-haul flight. On the way back, you again fly to Frankfurt, and your luggage arrives on the, train, at the railway station somewhere else. So I think that is possible. But I think in Germany it's happening from Stuttgart to Frankfurt and I think Cologne to Frankfurt. I know Air France in, uh, uh, Air France, in France does it offer similar things as well. 
but it only works if the airport is connected to a high-speed network. If it's not connected to the high-speed network, it will be very difficult to see some substitution there. But, and the problem then is, let's say we prohibit everyone who's flying from Innsbruck to Vienna just on that route. Then, people who want to connect to another flight can't get on that flight, because that probably wouldn't operate if it wasn't substituted by other people found that route as well. And people, for example, in Innsbruck would say, we don't have connections to the rest of the world. So it's a very difficult subject. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So it's obviously from, from, for the, the airlines wouldn't want to favor that if it was prohibited. But I think to, to make a solution, it needs to be something really big. So probably some government intervention. Yeah. But in fact, what do you do with the money? I mean, you still have the CO2 emissions. What is it that could help could this money actually help sustain building? Okay. So I think carbon offsetting schemes, you get some really certified schemes, also by the UN certified, that, um, uh, for example, focus on deforest, uh, reforestation. So some uh, trees that were cut down in the past in the Amazon uh, free plants again to take up the CO2. <laughs> I think there's some really good ones out there. I don't think they will solve the problem, but again, I think they, they do have a positive impact. With regards to this kind of emissions tax, so, very good point. So in, in the UK, for example, the air passenger duty was introduced 10, 15 years ago or so, and one reason was for environmental reasons. The money, though, goes just into the whole budget. It's, yeah, so it's exact. So basically, the origin they sold it as an environmental tax, but there's the only environmental impact it has that if you increase the price, demand drops. But the money is not used for environmental issues. So I think that is a big problem. I think it's just missold by the government. Because like many organizations, you don't know where the money goes, yeah. and it's just like passengers to see I don't think that that is, that is from, so one is kind of the voluntary scheme uh, where it's our decision whether we pay or not. And actually, there we can see the money is used for something. But with a lot of these kind of emissions tax or kind of the government schemes, it just goes into a central pot and we never see it again. But if you would put on tax emissions on the airline itself, would yeah. that like, keep the push them to, to reduce their emissions to gain more money? Yeah, I mean, that's what I really like about the EU, EU emissions trading scheme, the EU ETS, which basically would have done that. So every airline under this scheme will get a certain amount of CO2 emissions that they can use each year. And once they've used that, they need to buy it in. If you've got a very new and efficient fleet, if you've got new aircraft, if you don't burn a lot, you probably end up with more emissions certificates than you originally were allocated, and you can sell them to another airline. So actually, it's an incentive to be environmentally friendly, to produce fewer CO2 emissions, because you can make money out of it. On the other hand, if you don't do that, you know at the end of the year, probably in October, November, you run out, you will need to buy them, so it will be more expensive. So you're absolutely right. I think it would be a very good scheme. I, I really think, as an economist, that's perfect, or close to perfect. But then we had a complaint from many allies outside the EU that didn't want to pay, and really threatened to take legal action uh, against Europeans. And that's why it will stop for outside the EU. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, so you can do some things to all the aircraft as well. So one thing is winglets, which is basically extending the wing uh, at the end, which reduces the drag of the aircraft. And we see probably some fuel efficiencies of two, three, four percent. So that's one way that you can do as well. Um, another thing that happened, particularly if you think of back um, to the diagram about the different types of emissions, the noise emissions, and noise was a particular issue in the 70s and 80s, and what they've done with all the aircraft, they've uh, introduced something called hush kits, which is a noise cancelling device which you can put on the engine and make the aircraft quieter. Really good. The only disadvantage is it increases fuel consumption. So basically, you achieve savings with regards to noise emissions, but at the expense of fuel, emission, uh, fuel consumption and therefore CO2 emissions. 
But I think particularly winglets, for example, the extension is a definitely good thing for airlines to do. A lot of airlines do that. And if you go back to market incentives, obviously with increasing fuel prices, airlines have them also a kind of business incentive to reduce the, uh, the fuel consumption. And we saw that particularly up to 2000 or so when the oil price peaked, that really the airlines looked into a lot of different ways how they could reduce uh, their fuel consumption because it cost them a lot of money. What we've seen since the, um, um, with the economic downturn, also oil prices have come down again, so it's probably less of a pressing issue at the moment. But as we all know, oil is a finite resource. We know it will run out at one point, and if you think of supply and demand, that will mean that prices will go up eventually again. So they will have to look into that. Any more questions? Well, then thank you very much for listening. Robert, I have a small question. Oh. I'm sorry. In That's between. fine. Uh, because I was reading the students' questions uh, earlier on, and it might seem a bit odd to ask you to introduce yourself at the very end of the session. Okay. But uh, maybe if you could tell us a little bit of, uh, more about how you got to doing what you're doing now, and a little bit more about your career path. I saw a lot of students were interested in that. That's fine. So that's the easy part. Then. So basically, um, as in the beginning, I did the Modul Tourism College, and already during that time, I really liked planes. And um, after I did my a my matura, basically I thought I really want to work for an airline. But it's very difficult to work for an airline. It's sometimes very difficult to get in. So I actually applied also to work in a hotel in the summer. And I got actually on the same day an offer from a hotel and from Austrian Airlines. So I thought oh, I'd rather work for Austrian Airlines. So for three months I worked as a kind of in a, as an internship at the airport doing check-in and boarding. And for those of you who want to work for an airline, it's really useful if you start with an internship because once you're inside the company, it really helps to apply for jobs inside the company. Because once the three months were over, I was obviously looking for a proper job. And because I was working already for the company, I had access to all the internal job postings. So I applied to work in the customer relations department, which deals with customer complaints which at that time sounded like a really fantastic opportunity because you know people complain, you can be really nice to them, give them money, make them happy, uh, and they will fly with you for the rest of their lifetime. Um, after four years, I noticed uh, it doesn't quite work like that. So it's sometimes quite a big struggle because people complain about all sorts of things. So I worked for Austrian Airlines for four years and um, while I did my work there, I also did my part-time degree uh, in Vienna in European Business and Economics. And when I finished that, and I had worked four years in the complaints department, I really thought I can't work another year in complaints. It just uh, was a bit too much at that time. So I was looking for something different, and I decided to do a master's degree in England in air transport management. So while my undergraduate degree was quite a generic one, um, with my master's degree I really wanted to focus on something I like. And I studied at Cranfield University. I don't know if any one of you has heard of that university. It's north of London. And to my knowledge, it's one of probably the only university in Europe that has its own runway. So the campus has its own runway, and even has its own aircraft. So although I studied there for a year, I only flew once on the aircraft, but I still managed to get onto that aircraft. So I did that, and after that, um, I thought I need to look for a job. And I applied for quite a lot of jobs. Sometimes I didn't even read the job specifications, which didn't really help because I once got an interview to work for Stansted Airport to drive uh, one of their snow trucks. <laughs> uh, but I didn't really study for five, six, five years at that time to drive a snow tr truck, so I didn't go to that interview. But I was very lucky. I had a job interview with Qatar Airways, and I got a job interview with, Hudders with the University of Huddersfield. And the best thing about the job interview with Qatar Airways, the interview was in Doha, in the capital of Qatar, and they paid for a business class flight there, which was really good. So I flew out there, it was very hot, um, and the job was in customer relations, something I knew quite a lot about it. But at the end of the day, I had my offer from Huddersfield of working with customer complaints, and I thought, I really can't do another year of customer complaints. So, uh, I started working in, at the University of Huddersfield, and when I started, the university had done for many years transport courses and uh, tourism courses, but they were planning to set up an air transport course. So my first year, I did a bit of teaching, but I focused a lot on kind of developing 
a new course in, called Air Transport and Logistics Management. So covering both the air transport side, but also looking at freight transport, and no one had done that before. So that's what, I did, what I've been doing for the last eight years there. And in between, because I really like um, planes, I thought I need to do some research as well. So in 2007, so quite some time ago, I decided to do a PhD on green airline marketing. And um, because obviously green airline marketing is a very difficult subject area, that's why it took quite a time, some time to do it. But in May this year, I submitted it, so I'm glad I don't have to do any more research on that. So I've done quite a lot of air transport related stuff, both working in the industry and doing research in the area, because I really like it. I like flying, and I'm probably, like most of you, I, I like flying. I know about the environmental issues, but it is probably like a behavioral addiction, as I said in the beginning, that we just like flying. But I think in the long run, run or mid term run, we really need to address it. I hope that answered your question as well.